Welcome everyone to our next episode of Big Data Talks, in which we have conversations with industry experts about the way in which data, machine learning, and artificial intelligence are changing the way we live. My name is Jan Willem Middelberg and I'm the host today. I'm the author of the Enterprise Big Data Framework, which is hosting this series of Big Data Talks today. You can always watch or listen back this recording on YouTube, the Big Data Framework website, and the podcasting platform on Apple Podcast. Today, I'm very happy to announce my next guest, Mr. Fogosi Sambo, who is based in South Africa. I met Fogosi earlier this year during our Big Data Days virtual conference, and I was so impressed with his speech about combinatorics and permutations that I wanted to pick his brain a little bit more today. In very simple words, he expressed that the number of potential combinations with Databricks can very quickly become infinite and has some very interesting theories behind that. Fukosi is a very experienced executive and renowned keynote speaker with extensive experience in healthcare, financial services, FMCG and market research. I'm therefore absolutely thrilled to have him as my guest today. Welcome to Big Data Talks, Fukosi. Happy to have you. Thanks, Jan. Thanks for having me. I'm glad to be here. And yeah, just a, a few months ago, we had the big data uh, conference and yeah, uh, happy with, to have this follow-up podcast to just chat a little bit about the thoughts that I shared uh, during the conference. So thank you for the opportunity. Absolutely. The pleasure is all mine. I thought you gave a very great lecture uh, and we got quite a lot of reactions afterwards that people said, well, we want to know a little bit more, so that is one of the main reasons why we decided to host this pack class today. Um, if you can uh, tell me a little bit around um, who you are, um, you're currently the head of data solutions at the Afrocentric Group. How did you get there? What has been your, your journey in a, in a very brief few minutes? So uh, post my uh, varsity studies, I joined a healthcare company, which is now my competitor. So now I'm, I'm now with the competitor. But uh, my undergrad studies were in uh, mathematical sciences, economic science, actuarial. And um, I started my job as an analyst. And I mean, back then, we didn't necessarily really have data science as we have it now. I mean, the whole uh, data space has just been continuously evolving, which is quite an exciting uh, thing because you really never get bored and there's always something uh, to learn and I'm a continuous uh, or lifelong learner, so I enjoy always having to learn something new and new challenges. Uh, so we started a bit more when it was still very much the traditional BI, uh, focused mainly on reporting. And uh, I spent the uh, first five years of my uh, career with uh, that organization, Discovery Health. Uh, I then moved on uh, to, to join uh, the global um, uh, measurement company, Nielsen. Uh, that's where I got exposed to the FMCG and also started getting exposed to the uh, data science work. That's when it was starting at the time. And um, I really enjoyed my time there and also really learned a lot, even in terms of the technologies that are predominantly used in the data science space. Uh, I went on to really uh, work for a bank and eventually uh, back into healthcare again as a chief data officer uh, for Cayello uh, before my current role now as the executive head of uh, data solutions and insights at um, the Afrocentric uh, uh, group and MedScheme. And yeah, my, my, my role really is uh, focused on really supporting business with actionable uh, insights from data by making sure that the whole end-to-end -end data delivery value chain is geared towards uh, enhancing business performance. So we are very value focused in how we look at um, data. I really, really enjoy that because I think it is, uh, really supports uh, what most of us have been advocating in terms of uh, data being an asset. So it is quite important for us uh, data practitioners and data leaders to ensure that um, we can really walk the talk in actually not just preaching that, but really uh, helping business uh, uh, improve revenue, drive efficiencies, uh, manage risk better, improve customer experience uh, to the greater benefit of the bottom line, but in a sustainable way, of course. So that's one of the things that from our approach to uh, data and analytics uh, in our organizations, we are very, very uh, passionate and intentional uh, about but uh, along the journey, I've also just uh, um, uh, really uh, studied quite a lot of um, uh, things that I think uh, for me has supported me in um, evolving quite nicely with uh, the data journey. 
as I've done cloud computing, AI, digital studies, and just general uh, business administration and management um, uh, uh, qualifications, including executive leadership program with uh, Oxford recently. Yes, so, so, just so, so many learn and grow. so many different topics to um, uh, to choose from, and uh, it's also something that we're going to talk a, a little bit more about in, in detail especially the journey and how you're using data on a day-to-day -day basis. But out of all these um, topics, there's this common red thread that I, I, I hear you speaking about, and that's your fascination for data. Any explanation where that is coming from? Yeah, I, I mean, uh, I hear in most circles, people think that data is like this cold, in your main, you're trying to make everything a number, be it people and so forth. But I actually um, uh, believe that uh, there's nothing that uh, has a better uh, chance of enhancing our quality of life and performance thereof uh, than data. So I think it helps us understand uh, our life a lot better. It helps us uh, be able to collect um, uh, the set of activities, which is what data really is. It's just uh, really taking uh, uh, the actions of our everyday life, whether you wake up, you call you, you call me, we're having this conversation, we're going to record it. It's also actually a form of data, though yeah. much more prominent in these days. We were all used uh, historically to relational uh, 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 structured data, but actually this uh, video conference is data of some, uh, of, some, of some form and now can even be analyzed in terms of even the images through computer visioning. So I just think that um, uh, data is so much um, part of what we do literally every minute that I think um, one understanding data is quite useful in them understanding their life better. And I think if you want to really just maximize and get the best out of your life, um, uh, I would advise anyone to find a way of uh, using data in one form or shape. And I think that's where my passion really uh, 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 comes from uh, in terms of optimizing one's human potential in whatever field or area you find yourself. Yeah, I think you're saying something which is really interesting. You're, you just said, I think there's nothing that has a better, bigger, can make a bigger impact on the quality of life uh, than data. Um, I think that's a very powerful statement. If you look in your personal work environment, and how, how do you use data in your day-to-day -day job on, on a very, I would say, operational level, uh, all the way towards very strategic decision-making? How do you embed that to make sure that you keep focused on taking this data-driven approach? Yeah, so, so, so uh, my perspective and the perspective of our organization um, uh, from a strategy, I've started at a strategic level is that um, uh, we, we need to be anchored in a, in, in a core purpose, you know, because that really uh, uh, galvanizes and build a goal, guiding coalition for people to really uh, stand behind in something that is value driven, something that really uh, resonates with people when they wake up day to day. And I think for us as an organization, uh, our, our role in terms of transforming the healthcare landscape of our country and continent at large is really through enabling access to quality health care at a lower cost. It is that simple. Uh, the dynamic that we face, especially in the South African context, is that um, only just over 9 million of our 60-odd uh, million population enjoys private health care insurance, uh, yeah. which leaves a huge burden for the state to cater for the balance. So whatever we can do to uh, ensure that uh, more people can have access to private health care through, from an affordability perspective, that is quite essential and that is the mission and what we as an organization really stand for. We cover almost four million of those lives, so almost half of the market share uh, belongs to, 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 to our organization. And uh, we use data to really understand all the data points in our interactions with our customers and when they interact with the healthcare providers and that's where the concept of combination combinatorics and permutation that i shared about comes from to better understand their healthcare and make sure that we start intervening at the right time at the right place at the right play with the right level of uh, health intervention for each one of our people so it has really become a great enhancer to our health risk management uh, strategy to give you context in the previous uh, financial year 
we saved uh, 4.2 billion rand uh, for our um, uh, our total members uh, because of these uh, uh, beta analytics that uh, 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 use data and insights. And to translate that, that uh, implies uh, 220 rand in South African context per, per member per month. And that is uh, around about almost 10% of uh, someone's contribution. So that's quite significant. And you can put that back in lower increase or enhancing even the benefits that they get from their cover. So uh, we are seeing tangible uh, benefits of um, a greater use of uh, data and insights in our in, in our organization and now we we really are driving towards that true north or the core mission or purpose of what we really stand for but more operationally we we are very passionate about measuring everything we say we measure everything that moves if it doesn't move we kick it until it moves and we measure it so um, even from our people the enterprise performance measurement framework itself the day-to-day -day activities all of that is measured with the intention of just gaining insights to help in as the performance of uh, uh, each member of the organization if you think of it from a systems thinking point of view and we have seen that uh, great impact and the shift of our bell curve um, and normal distribution performance of uh, our, our people in the organization uh, in the right direction so that is quite pleasing yeah absolutely and i i, I like the the quote you're saying we, we measure everything that moves uh, and apparently it's working uh, with uh, what you mentioned uh, half the population is part of your market share so if, if we dive a little bit deeper into that, um, I obviously know that in insurance, there's a, a ton of data that we can collect around um, the way that people live, uh, the, the way that people operate, the things that they're doing, and to adjust premiums and insurance programs around that. If we go a little bit into the more specific areas, what is the, 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 the kind of data that you're most interested in? Uh, and uh, especially since we're talking typically around personal data. How do you collect that from, from your customers? So I, I must say, firstly, I think in terms of data collection, a lot has become easier than it used to be uh, back in the days. I think most of the data, in my view, sort of already exists. It's, all, it's mainly uh, about uh, tapping into it and making sure that we obviously do it responsibly and obviously following all the uh, a GDPR or in our in, in our South African context we call it papaya from a privacy perspective but if you really look at the nature of the healthcare dynamics of our country from a wellness and lifestyle point of view uh, what we are sitting in, uh, with is that um, uh, really about 60 percent of 65 uh, percent of the healthcare expenditure is driven by um, cardiovascular diseases, diabetes, respiratory, and cancer. And most of these are as a result of uh, nutrition, smoking behavior, alcohol uh, consumption, and physical activity. So these are lifestyle-related uh, diseases, and it really accounts for all of the, uh, for 80% for of all uh, NCD deaths. So that's quite a, a, a very fascinating, and 90% of type 2 diabetes, for example, uh, and 80% of coronary artery diseases and a third of cancers can be avoided through lifestyle behavior change. So we are very, very much uh, invested in understanding behavioral related data and seeing how we can intervene to really nudge and encourage people to alter their behavior and lifestyle and take charge of their healthcare, putting back that power uh, to the customer so that we can have the better healthcare outcomes over time because we always look at the entire continuum of health from the area of wellness all the way to palliative care and, uh, and chronic uh, state and try to understand how do we keep shifting as many people to a one stage or two stage um, yeah. uh, backwards in terms of better state of health. Uh, so, so, so really uh, we are very interested in, in tracking that through tracking the kind of medication that people live in use when they go to a pharmacy over the counter and start picking up some of these trends early, encouraging um, early screening, early diagnosis so that we treat people better, get those that need to be uh, uh, put on a, a chronic management programs early yeah. enough so that the long-term effects of their health is, uh, and wellness is enhanced. So those, those are kind of uh, some of the data points that we... Uh, 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 invested in collecting and we do collect and we collect uh, literally about uh, 25 uh, million records from an Afrocentric group perspective um, a month. So you, you can see when you start uh, 
stitching those uh, data bricks and clicking them, um, the kind of combinations and permutation and stories that come out of each and every customer that you have about their state of health and wellness. Yeah, and, and that's tremendous volumes of data, I can only imagine. So how do you um, uh, convince people um, to, sh to share that data with you? Are you using mobile applications or do you get the data from, from the providers who are providing the medicines? Because, um, yeah, it, especially tracking people over longer periods of time requires a constant monitoring. And what I've heard with a lot of other providers is that getting data at one specific point in their life cycle or in their journey is typically the easy part. But how do you make sure that you can measure those things consistently over time um, so that it's not just a one point observation, but that you can actually see that behavioral change that you're talking about? What, what have you found to so, be the most effective way? So, I mean, uh, on our side, there are parts that are much easier because we see it more as the funder or the administrator that uh, collects the monthly premiums on behalf of the uh, the schemes and then the members okay. and we obviously facilitate uh, the, the transactions in terms of claims payment whenever you go to a doctor or to a pharmacy and uh, in most of those instances we do it real time like in a pharmacy you get benefit confirmation when you're standing in front of your pharmacist right so um, as a result because we have to facilitate the the paying of the provider uh, we obviously need to receive that data with the right um, uh, 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 ICD-10 codes or uh, the diagnosis uh, thereof so that we understand what benefit we're paying for and what are the limits applicable to that benefit mm -hmm. and what they tell us about that some, uh, someone's state of health. So that part of the data is much easier to get where it's uh, sometimes a little bit more challenging. It's more on the behavioral and lifestyle sort of data where you need to obviously um, encourage the people to sort of um, um, uh, come to wellness programs or uh, have maybe a wearables or variables or whatever we want to call them these days and giving you consent to have access to that information. So we, we obviously always do everything within the con confines of the legislative uh, framework that we operate in. But um, the, the big view, my, my big view around uh, all the, the whole data sharing is that it's centered around trust. And whenever um, uh, you want to build that, you need to have consistency and always encourage people that you are really uh, doing uh, this to enhance the experience and the well-being of the of, of the customer. And once you really achieve that, people are a lot easier to, uh, to, to be able to share the data and making sure that you are as transparent as possible in terms of how you're going to use the data and um, uh, reassuring them that they are still at the center uh, of that concern in terms of decision making of what can or can't be done with their data. So I think um, there are different methods. We, we all still have a long way to go. Uh, we are all still grappling with uh, even the legislative um, interpretation in some instances of uh, how to navigate the privacy landscape from a data point of view. And I think it's a bit of a global problem and not just so much a South African problem. Yeah. What, what, what you're saying is, is very interesting, especially when it comes towards tailoring the offering towards individuals. Um, would you say that you're already at a level where you have some of that predictive capability? So in other words, if you are having a particular profile, do you already know that if you show them these wellness programs or you put them onto this particular track, that you can predict that this person will become either more healthy or will have a less chance of attracting a specific disease? Are you already able to kind of get towards those kind of predictive models given your large data sets? Yes, definitely. So I can confirm that we're able to. So the 4.2 billion rand uh, annual savings that I spoke uh, about actually really comes from the different um, domains uh, of, uh, of, our, of our healthcare delivery value chain, uh, we call it, because uh, as an Afrocentric organization, we are uh, the most diversified from a healthcare perspective in South Africa, all the way from the normal primary healthcare, medical aid administration and health risk management to, uh, to, 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 uh, to the pharma cluster and corporate wellness solutions, including EAP. So we've got a very good holistic understanding of someone's wellness. Uh, so um, what we do uh, see is that most people that we put on uh, some of our world class programs like our HIV program called Aid for AIDS, 
um, and we drive high adherence by also ensuring that through our pharmacy direct subsidiary, people are having their chronic scripts delivered consistently and is driving higher adherence to that medication. We are seeing lesser hospitalization per thousand lives on a regular basis and that's where most of your uh, well, yeah, healthcare expenditure also sit in terms of hospitalization uh, be, be being quite um, uh, 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 more expensive than someone visiting their day-to-day -day, uh, uh, general practitioner or doctor. So we have seen that impact and that's where most of that saving is coming from. We also manufacture drugs um, uh, with, a, with a license, so we're seeing also the move towards generic medication also driving quite a lot of the health core cost from a medicine risk management uh, down. So we are measuring all of this and we are seeing better healthcare outcomes, uh, better return on investment and just the better patient experience because we are able to understand the ecosystem in its entirety better than, um, I suppose, uh, our competitors in this space. It's quite fascinating and don't you think, if you think about that, because especially the world of medicine, medication, pharmacies, has traditionally been focused a lot around research and development. Do you think that this whole industry, uh, including the insurance, obviously, is going to be completely data-driven? I, 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 I believe so, and I think uh, what data is done in computing power and, uh, uh, and, and this uh, modern technologies that allows you to uh, run these complex algorithms uh, of machine learning and AI at uh, speed. Uh, for me, I've just put, uh, it's, it's research and development on steroids. That's what I really actually <laughs> call it. So uh, I feel like back in the days, you will have these trials that will invest hundreds and billions uh, and billions on it to over 10 years to eventually uh, get something that gets approved by. Um, uh, the federal or the the the, the, the legislator uh, uh, the, the legislator in your respective country, and that's why you had this whole challenge even around pricing because people that would put that money behind that R and D wanted also the return on investment for that sure. um, extended uh, piece of work. So now data, I feel like, is fast tracking a whole lot of that, and it's bringing this convergence between um, data technology and also the clinical. Uh, knowledge that I think uh, historically has just really set with the clinicians and that's why the research and development was very laboratory driven and very clinical in nature um, uh, compared to uh, now this uh, augmented um, uh, approach between data analytics technology and also uh, just the, uh, the, 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 the clinicians themselves. So they still have a role to play but I think now they're able to achieve more faster and uh, with more accuracy and certainty than uh, probably they did uh, decades ago. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I, and I also see this. I, I see the world of medicine and um, um, healthcare. It's basically converging with the world of IT and, and data science. Um, what I always find interesting, or at least um, it causes a lot of, I would say, misconceptions and a lot of discussion, is how do you build that bridge? Because if you look at the way that current doctors and, and physicians are being taught, it's mostly still, I would say, the more traditional diagnosis kind of uh, educational path. Whereas if we look at it, um, yeah, a lot of the decision making in the future will be based upon data. How do you bridge that gap in, in, in your company? So how do you make sure that you educate the healthcare providers, the insurance uh, um, uh, people around what is what they can do with data how, how do you make them data literate so I, I think for me i mean if you look um, in in our country especially one of the challenges that the doctors uh, just want to do what they've been trained to do which is to treat and diagnose um, uh, the, the patient you know and in most instances even in terms of the digital adoption is much lower in that um, field strange enough compared to even other fields and uh, wh what we have found uh, uh, just to clarify is that data and all these sciences not should not be viewed as trying to replace the doctor we believe firmly believe that there's still a role of the doctor but all we are saying is that through electronic health records and patient records at the uh, prerogative of the uh, patient's consent 
uh, can be shared um, with the uh, uh, provider at the point of care when you are sitting yeah. in front of a doctor so that they can have better context on how to better diagnose you. So we see it as a bit of an augmented technology kind of solution rather than one that needs to be viewed as if it's replacing the traditional um, doctor-patient um, way of care and relationship. We, we facilitate that care a, a lot better. So we actually see it the same way you would view your Uber. We are not trying to be, the car still has a role to take you to your destination, <laughs> but it's about how seamless the experience, the pricing, and you being able to um, uh, monitor everything that uh, has to do with um, uh, that journey from a safety point of view and otherwise. So we, we are equally invested in trying to achieve the same thing to ensuring that you are going to a doctor that will treat you with better healthcare outcomes because they are using uh, these augmented technologies that improve their uh, diagnosis and we are seeing better outcomes from their practice in terms of people that maybe get hospitalized that they had been initially treated by them and and all that dynamic so 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 actually it's a bit of an augmented solution uh, where the role of um, treating doctors we believe will evolve but they will still uh, have a role they are still the doctors we are not doctors we are just facilitators of um, yeah. that, that, that that care or service yeah no, so you already um, touched upon it a little bit and you said we're, we're starting to track almost everything. And I think that that is becoming a fact of life. You can resist that, but um, through sensors, through cameras, through sessions like we're doing right now, uh, data is collected with a speed that we've never seen before. In a lot of countries, and I'm pretty sure it's uh, the same in your um, part, there is a lot of discussion around the debates between ethical considerations around collecting customer data, data privacy, um, and cost. So on the one hand, um, the more data you collect, the more uh, the lower your insurance premiums can be. Uh, in most cases, it makes the delivery of healthcare much more competitive, much more cost-effective, and you can serve larger numbers of people. So that has also significant benefits for a country. On the other hand, you have the people who say, well, it's too invasive in terms of privacy. I want to be in control of my own data. Um, the the, the um, uh, United Nations even s said that, you know, your own personal data is, is a basic human right. So it's not something that companies can just, um, you know, benefit from. How do you see the balance between these two opposite views? And what's your opinion around the difference between the need for privacy versus the fact that it can make companies and corporations and therefore countries much, much better. So, uh, so the first view, I think, uh, you know, uh, we are very clear to say we uh, privacy is very, very important. And that's why we've always put the customer or the patient at the center of that um, equation or that interaction in terms of uh, how and what data we collect and for what use, and we try to be as transparent as possible to explain uh, the benefits thereof, um, uh, still uh, uh, leaving the room for, for, for the member or the customer to either consent or not consent, or even at any point in time um, change their views around it. And I think that should not never go away. Um, with the, the idea uh, I explained later, even in terms of being effective with how we manage health and wellness going forward, it's all about putting and empowering the, uh, the patient so that they can um, uh, self-drive uh, 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 and self-motivate to achieve uh, uh, the, the, their objectives. Um, I do believe that there's a role for, um, uh, for, 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 for from a governance perspective and, and also from a legislative uh, point of view that either governments will have to play. But uh, more than anything else, I think it's an education thing uh, and uh, really reassuring people um, of the use, uh, use cases of why the data is being collected. And I think that's why we are seeing this very good rise in the movement of uh, data or an AI for good. And I think um, we, we need to continue doing quite uh, a lot of work uh, in terms of uh, 
making people understand how different platforms and, uh, and sectors and ecosystems converge together to just uh, improve the quality of life, not just at an individual level, but at a community and also at a broader uh, uh, country and even global level. And I think uh, if we can build more models uh, to, uh, to show the aggregated impact and the coordination and the integration of these efforts uh, from use of data ethically and responsibly, but for the uh, good social um, outcomes and also just the overall ESG outcomes, uh, I think we will um, really uh, make good progress because I think people resonate and understand um, uh, the, those elements and uh, in most cases they are central to people's value systems anyway so it's just making sure that people or the uh, society can have confidence in these organizations that are the data organization or the technology organization to say we are driving same interests same outcomes and everyone understands their role in contributing to the bigger picture of where we are going as a society and there's a greater good at even a country or continental at global level um, and that is what I, th I suppose the data for good or AI for good kind of movements uh, are moving towards. And we all need to do our part in being leaders and advocates and thought leaders of what that means in our, part in our respective regions. Absolutely. I, I really like what you're saying, especially the fact that we need to keep educating. I think um, with all the technologies that are developing so fast nowadays, it's just very hard to keep track. In the last few years, everyone has been hearing around big data, machine learning, artificial intelligence. There's now a whole lot of um, a discussion around collecting data through sensors, Internet of Things, and maybe even storing your, your um, private or your um, patient records on things like blockchain systems. Um, and what I found is that a lot of people find it difficult to grasp all of these technologies. I'm in the IT domain and I sometimes already need to do a lot of reading to kind of keep up to date with all these different uh, um, technologies. Do you think from that perspective that because technology has been going so rapid and so fact, uh, so uh, part is that because people don't understand it properly, it kind of scares them? Definitely, it, um, I mean, it even scares the professionals themselves, right? It's overwhelming, it's, uh, like you say, the, the change is rapid, um, and also the change is even further fast-tracked by the rate of disruptions uh, globally, be it politically and otherwise. So we all have to constantly find a new ways of work and uh, remaining sustainable, be it as business, as societies, as governments, and even at an individual level. So I think uh, the, the, the rate of disruption is, is much higher, both in frequency and severity. And um, uh, it, 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 it's all about, about all of us adjusting our expectation uh, around that. I do think that the role that then we need to play is um, uh, going back to a little bit of the basics because technologies will come and go. Yeah. And the whole idea for me has always been um, if the value system and the values that we're driving and we are very clear about the simple basic outcomes of why we're doing what we're doing and bringing technology along to support and enhance and optimize that, then it becomes less a technology discussion than um, a, a, a value uh, discussion and it's easier for people to find alignment. So like I gave an example in our case, what we, we are very clear and always passionate about is being able to come at the end and say, well, all these things that we're doing that you may never be able to understand in, the, in, in million years because you are not maybe a, a data scientist and so forth, are geared towards making sure that your, 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 your insurance premiums are, are affordable, they are cheaper, but we do that without compromising the quality of care and service that you receive. Actually, we are also using it to enhance that as well. Uh, then people are a little bit more at ease and just building that trust and trust takes consistency and it takes time absolutely to mature yeah, yeah. that's for sure so, yeah. so you mentioned technologies come and go is there one specific technology that you've been seeing coming up let's say in the last few years that you think is really going to change the insurance industry sure <laughs> quite a few look i i must say that i mean uh, 
the, the, the wearables and bearables and these sensors have been quite revolutionary for us because I think they've shifted us from a reactive uh, approach to managing health uh, and risk uh, yeah. to a bit more uh, proactive because it allows us to act quicker, it allows us to uh, model certain um, uh, readings from your health vitals to be able to uh, start uh, predicting set, uh, certain risk and recommend even say further tests so that we can at least um, uh, either prevent or treat you early if maybe uh, there's confirmation of certain existing uh, conditions, be it chronic or otherwise. So I, I think that has been quite a big um, uh, revolution. Uh, I do think that also the um, uh, telemedicine um, as, uh, or telehealth, as you would like yeah. to call it, has been quite uh, impactful and COVID um, uh, has fast-tracked quite a lot of that in some areas like uh, our country. Uh, because I think in our country, over and above the patient side of things, if you look at the number of um, uh, doctors per, per thousand people or per million people in this country, it's still quite low. So we are under-resourced from that perspective and also uh, p uh, people's access to some of these doctors, they're generally concentrated in urban areas. So when you bring uh, technology such as your virtual consultation um, uh, to, 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 the front, to the front, you, you start seeing ease of access. So now I can access any doctor from anywhere, anytime, and still most likely get as accurate of a diagnosis as I would have by f physically visiting the doctor. Uh, the, the conversation is much shorter, so probably the doctor is even able to see much more patients. But obviously, depending on the, uh, the condition and the diagnosis, you may eventually need to go see someone physically from a referral perspective if it is connected to a specialist. So um, I think those two technologies for me have been uh, quite key, and obviously uh, the data that has been uh, just uh, escalating in terms of um, acceleration of big data and our ability to process uh, that uh, through cloud technologies and also these um, complex algorithms that machine learning and artificial intelligence allows us to um, has just created a perfect storm that I think uh, makes the future of healthcare or even any industry quite bright if we obviously do it ethically uh, and, and respecting people's uh, privacy uh, uh, as much as possible as we earlier discussed. Absolutely. I think a perfect storm is kind of a good way to summarize what is uh, um, coming with these new technologies. And as you mentioned, these are also the, the technologies that generate, start to generate a lot of additional big data, which can help yeah. in, in, in turn to make these predictions even better. Very, very interesting. Uh, Fukosi, one of the other reasons I wanted to talk to you a little bit today is I know you're very passionate around democratization of data and insights to make world a better place not just from uh, insurance and healthcare point of view but more in general C can you explain a little bit around what you mean with democratization of data and insights yeah. so um it, it means uh, uh, so in simplicity if you were to google that definition right you'll find most of it centered around access you know, yeah. but uh, if it was that easy, we would flick the switch and give Jan <laughs> access to his data. And I wish it were that easy. Would be solved. My, my, my job was, would be that easy, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> even, even internally. But I think what we are starting to quickly see is that it's um, access with meaning. Because um, the world has never had more data than we do now. We generate 2.5 quintillion bytes of um, uh, data daily. So we are not uh, starved of data. By, by no means, but we are starved of insights yeah. because insight is what drives a call to an action. And now we really achieved that for us uh, in terms of how to get democratization right and be effective um, means that we need to understand what are these key attributes or, or, or behaviors that people exhibit on a day-to-day -day basis and we're also seeing within the digital trends. So access being one of them, but um, you obviously need to be insightful tell them something that will drive them to a specific action or intervention that will help you eventually uh, uh, realize the, the, the value or the, or, 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 the, or the outcome that you're trying to really drive. And then uh, over and above that is really the, the effective way to do it is to be dynamic and customized, you know, tell me what's relevant for me. Yeah. And uh, allow me to be part of your conversation, connect with me, 
and let me be part of that. That's why the social media movement has become so powerful in creating that network effects. But also at the end of the day, collaborate um, with your users to create value because we are all after value. Everyone wants to know what's in it for me, organizationally and individually. And that's what obviously attracts people to, to, to come forward and participate and create a partnership with whatever you are doing. So uh, those five pillars for me, uh, from access to insights to being dynamic and customizing to connecting and engaging with the people and collaborating to create value for uh, and shared value for everyone uh, are, are quite key to effective uh, democratization and not just think that you can just flick a switch and give someone uh, access. Yeah. And I think in the simplest way to get a good baseline with people is to sort of embed your insights into their day-to-day -day activities, you know, to say, um, uh, if you look at you, there are certain things that you sort of do every day. You brush your teeth every day, you know, you take a shower every day or whatever the case is. So even in, in workplace, what are some of those simple mundane things that are really part of every day? Because you want to build a habit, you want to build the, the culture. Culture is, comes out of habit, you know, you, can, you have to really embed it in, in, in people's way of life. So also finding those opportunities of embedding yourself in the simple, basic day-to-day -day things that people are engaged with uh, is quite key to achieving democratization that is also a function of the culture, uh, organizationally and otherwise. Yeah, absolutely. What, what could um, national governments or, let's say, big corporates do to increase that democratization? What is the role for those major organizations and what would be... Um, things that you would say, well, we could step up our level of um, commitment or time and maybe even money to increase uh, democratization across the world? Uh, I think technology still has a, a role to play and, and, yeah. and more so from um, what I will call uh, digital democratization, people's access to even simple things as internet. In certain parts of the world, I don't think it's uh, necessarily uh, a sweeping statement, but in our world and in the African continent, some of those barriers are still actually quite um, um, uh, a challenge. So I, so I think governments could invest, invest a lot from an infrastructure perspective to continue uh, driving the digital transformation agenda at, um, at a country level uh, or, or continental level in, in the African case. So I think that's a one big investment that could go really a long way. And I think just the simplicity to translate um, most of these efforts in a simple, tangible way that communicates value to the, uh, to, to the users. And that's why uh, when we, uh, I spoke earlier at the conference and I used this analogy of the Lego, uh, uh, one of my concluding thoughts was that um, from a two-year-old to an eight-year-old or 50-year-old more as should um, a Lego builder or whatever that has been playing with these uh, blocks for, for longer. They're likely to build better structures than the other, but the whole idea is that everyone gets to play and everyone gets to have fun. And I think that for me is really, really quite fundamental is to um, uh, gamify and get er as many people involved as possible and demystify the whole fear around data and analytics itself. I mean, you guys generally look at us as if like we are a bit of unicorns or some people who belong from another planet. Uh, um, but it's actually not always as complicated. It, uh, it can be simplified. It can be made as basic. Um, and part of everyday decision in most cases, yeah, just absolutely. like money has become, and that, that's data itself. <laughs> absolutely, yeah. The currency is also just a form of, uh, of data, ultimately. Um, for, for the people who are wondering, um, um, Wolf Fukosi was just talking about, um, there's a lecture on, from the Big Data Days on the YouTube channel where you can find the whole uh, lecture around combinatorics and permutations, which... Uh, basically builds upon those uh, Lego blocks uh, step by step. Because we're, we're almost getting towards the end of our time. <laughs> time really flies when I'm talking to you. Um, it's always going so rapidly. You have so much um, insights, so many good ideas, uh, and I could probably spend another two, three hours talking to you very easily um, because it doesn't really feel like an interview. It's more of a, of a conversation. There's just one final question that I have um, with the Big Data Framework Alliance. You know, we're trying to promote and advocate for big data best practices all around the world. 
by providing education, educational materials, make sure that people become more data literate uh, and invest time uh, to learn around all of these new technologies that we've been talking about. As you know, uh, we have an ambassador program um, for different regions to be a voice for a big data framework. Um, and I would be kind of honored to invite you as an ambassador for um, the African region. Would you uh, accept my invitation? Uh, I'm, I'm humbled and uh, really uh, grateful. Uh, definite, definite big yes. And uh, looking forward to partnering with you and the big data um, uh, uh, framework and community to really, really just drive the best uh, practice, the ethical practices, and really uh, elevate data as data for good to really build uh, our organizations, our communities, our countries, and our continent. So the answer is definitely yes. And I'm looking forward to working with you, John. Uh, very, very excited and very humbled by the, by the ask <laughs> and overwhelmed. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much for Evukosi. Um, it's been an absolute pleasure to talk to you again. Uh, so thank you for so much for participating today in Big Data Talks. Um, your words of wisdom, I think, are greatly appreciated. I think they're also very, very inspiring. Uh, I could probably already make six or seven quotes just from the hour that we've been talking to each other. Um, and it's really inspiring to hear you talk about the way in which data is going to change the way we live, which ultimately is the, the main focus of this podcast. So thank you so much for your time. Uh, and I am going to be in touch with you about the ambassador program. Thanks so much. Th 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 thank you so much, Jen, and thanks for the opportunity and thanks for the great conversation as always. Thank you.